Hello, hello, hello. It is me, the Texture System himself, Shane Moore, coming out, coming to you straight out of Texas. And man, have we got a show tonight. This is going to be the third in a series of maybe endless series because this is what it's all about. This is, this is the truth of the ages, of every age, no matter where what time period you may have lived in, whether it be thousands of years ago or in the future, it will be the truth and remain the truth as it always has. Now, this truth that I'm talking about has been hidden, has been purposefully hidden by the powers that be. Hey, Nazarene, glad you joined us or joined me. <laughs> I think I've got a mouse in my pocket. Um, but this, this knowledge is so powerful that the, that the powers that be in every age have made sure that it was kept hidden and that it was kept secret, concealed, but it was hidden in plain sight. And it still is. The only thing you need is you need to know what it is. You need to know what it is in itself. And what it is, is it is a puzzle. It is a riddle. It is a series of riddles. It is a series of Symbolic language, metaphorical language, allegory, and did I mention symbolism? It is absolutely, positively a description in every sacred text, and I say quote-unquote sacred text, because when we think about uh, uh, something being sacred, well, we automatically think about heaven and what we've been told from, from our youth, very, very young, that there's streets of gold and, and, a, and a crystal sea and um, God on his throne and the light that shines so brightly that you can't look into it and how that... that Everyone's going to be there, all of your loved ones, and so on. But but I have I have good news for you. As a matter of fact, that that was the the actual term that was used for this knowledge, and then it was, and then gospel took its place. It was actually called the good news, and Christianity was not always called Christianity. Matter of fact, Jesus, Jesus did not start Christianity. And when I say Jesus, I quote unquote Jesus, because like I say, everything is a is concealed in the metaphorical language, the allegories, and symbolism. And it has to do with a very, very important person. The most important person in the world. And that person is you. What did God tell Moses in the Bible his name was? Moses said, Who shall I tell Pharaoh who sent me? And he said, tell him, I am that I am sent you. Nazarene, since you're the only one here, I, I, I would ask you, what is God's name? He just, he just told Moses, tell him, I am that I am sent you. So, therefore, God's name would be, I am, Correct. And if I asked you that question, what is God's name? You would say, I am. And I would say, yes, you are, if you can accept it. 
if you can accept it, if you can realize it, and you can do the work, and when I say the work, it's preparation. That's all it is, is preparation. And I will get into that because we have been taught time and time again, all of our lives, that the power from on high, the true spiritual power, the uh, baptism of fire, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you are endued with power from on high, where uh, the, the, um, the Holy Grail, the horn of plenty that never runs out, you know, all of these are, metaphor, are metaphors for the same thing. And it is, it, is some, it is something that happens in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is not, is not beyond the clouds. It's not in outer space. It's not in on another planet or in a constellation. Jesus says in Luke chapter 21, verse 17, he says plainly, undeniably, and he, he tells the truth. And it is, it is amazing that that I was in in the church for um, twenty years until I stopped going because I I could see it for what it was. I didn't understand what was going on, but I knew that that no one there was actually receiving the power, the empowerment. And the truth, the knowledge that changes you, that betters you, that empowers you, I knew I wasn't receiving it, and I would look around. I'm, I'm a people watcher, and I could see these people, and they're sitting there like mannequins. They're, they were only there to, I guess, say they went, or they thought that by going, by being there, that they were somehow pleasing God that they believed was way out in heaven or in a, a, another dimension or somewhere else. But Jesus says in Luke 21, Chapter, uh, chapter 21, verse 17, and, uh, uh, excuse me, not, not verse 17, it is, um, well, I lost, he, <clears throat> I lost my notes, but um, he says, um, basically he says, um, When they tell you, I am here, or the kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God is at hand, it is here, it is there, lo, it is out here, it's in the wilderness, it's in the temple, uh, it's, it's coming on the clouds of glory, believe them not. Believe them not. Don't believe them. And he said, basically he was frustrated. He says, don't you understand by now? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Where? Within you. Within me. Within John. Within Sally. Within David within Shirley, within Kim, within Nazreen, 
Why is that? Because I'll give you a hint. The prayer that every Jewish person, every person that um, is of the is of Judaism, their prayer every morning is the Lord our God is one. The Lord our God is one. It's pretty simple, right? What does that mean? It means that you, whoever's listening, you are God. I know that's bold. I know it sounds like blasphemy. It sounds like I'm probably the Antichrist. But I'm telling you that I'm just the opposite. I'm not teaching this to say the Bible is evil or that it's a lie or that it is bad. I'm actually teaching it to further the truth, to promulgate the truth. And the reason for that is, is because any adult that reads the Bible and reads the events in the Bible and reads the accounts of the things that took place in the Bible, there is no way, no way in your right mind that you can tell me that you honestly believe that these things happened. That a man was swallowed by a fish, by a whale, and lived three days inside of that whale, and the whale was led by God to take him and vomit him on the shore, and he goes into town covered in whale vomit and preaches to the people, and the entire city saved. That does not happen. If it did, it would be recorded all over the place, not just the Bible. And that's something that you'll see more and more and more throughout the Bible, is that the events, the people described in the Bible, are not real people. They are characters. It is fiction. It was written to convey truth, universal truth, that is so high that only by the by using these stories and these these uh, you know, fictional characters can it be explained for instance um, the um, for those who say no no I believe from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to the last verse of Revelation the Old and New Testament as literal I'm telling you you are wrong you're not to take it literally who says you're not to take it literally? The Bible itself. And when I come back, I'm going to, to go through where the Bible says plainly what it is. And it is not what you have been led to believe. It's not what you've been taught to believe it is. And I will also explain much, much more how history itself has been altered and that basically this, this, is, this is so big, this is so vast that you may find yourself thinking, I don't know if I can trust anything anymore. 
Oh, but you can. Because when, when you experience truth, especially this truth, you know it. How do you know it? Because it literally resonates with you. With every DNA molecule in your body, it resonates on every level. Your mind, your spirit, which I'll get into that. It's not actually spirit after all. It's energy. It's energy. What is it? It's light. And I'll show you how that's been encoded in the Bible. And I keep saying the Bible because I have not studied the Quran. I've not studied the Bhagavad Gita uh, extensively. Matter of fact, hardly at all. So just bear with me. I'm not preaching. I'm not trying to convert you to Christianity. Matter of fact, I'm saying stay away from it. Stay away from every belief system there is. Because it doesn't matter what belief system. And I know there's going to be people that are going to say, say, oh my God. No, there's only one way. There's only one way to salvation, to eternal life. There's only one way to heaven. And that is by Jesus and only Jesus. And everybody else, no matter how good they were, no matter how much they gave in life, no matter how much they loved and never hated, Christians will say, because they didn't accept Christ as their Savior, they are going to burn in hell for all eternity in a torture that you cannot imagine forever and forever and forever and forever with no chance of escape, no chance of parole, but God loves you unconditionally. Is that insane or what? That's not unconditional love. That makes you think. Why is that? Because it was written that way to make you think. To make you say, hmm, this doesn't make sense. It says here, one thing, it says here the opposite. What's going on here? Exactly what the writers wanted you to do. Wanted you to do what? To go down to your local church and talk to your to the pastor there who is as lost as a goat in a hailstorm. By the way, here in Texas, goats that are in hailstorms, they stand out in the hailstorm looking up to see what's coming down and they get their head busted by what? By a hailstone. As lost as a goat in a hailstorm. And I'm telling you, I see it every day and I you my face probably looks like my palm because I face palm so much. People talking about Jesus is going to return on a white stallion and he's going to save us all. No, he's not. But on the other hand, yes he is. It's just not the way you think it is. It's not what you think it is. It's something that will not only, it will blow your mind away, and by doing so, you will be empowered. This is hope. This is truth. This is life changing. If I'm lying, I'm dying. I'm telling you the ultimate truth and it just took me a little over 51 years to find it and I'm glad I did I will be back in three minutes so hang tight
This is very, very important to every person because the the uh, the uh, your very uh, uh, your thing that that you know says that it leads to our salvation or that it is our salvation if we'll 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 only follow it actually is not but it is it's just that we have been misled by people who misled us or they taught us deliberately or quite possibly the case is is they themselves were misled and the truth is is it just takes one generation 
just takes one generation to to teach teach uh, you something broad enough on a grand enough scale to change the world forever. Just one generation. And what is a generation? What, 20 years? It's like mom and daddy, they teach their children, okay, there's a God in heaven, and he looks like this, and they show a picture of what Michelangelo, you know, painted on the Sistine Chapel, you know, ceiling or whatever, and Jesus looks like this, and we've all seen the, you know, depictions of Jesus, and my question is, is, um, is, um, it's amazing how Jesus has to be white, has to be white, has to be conservative, and uh, probably Republican, <laughs> and um, that was not the case according to the Bible. Jesus was a revolutionary. He was... He was there to not only shake the boat, he was there to flip the boat over. He was there to sink the boat. And for years, I wondered why that, that he said, you think I've come to bring peace? He said, I've not come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. And I've always wondered, what is he talking What does that mean? What it means is, is, is um, when he said that, he says, what he's saying is, is the message, the truth that I have to teach is different from anything you've ever heard. Why is that? Because it is absolute truth. It changes you. It's powerful. It changes you on a physical level. It changes you on a mental level, emotionally, and much, much more. Matter of fact, whenever Jesus says, says in, in those days, talking about the last days or, you know, the end times, and when, when he talked about the end times, do you know that, that that word times is act, actually mean, actually should say end of the age. End of the age. Okay. Now, what does that mean? It means the end of the age of Pisces. You know, there's there's a 2160 year um, house, astrological house, that lasts 2,160 years. I believe that's correct. But anyway, there's a house, and it lasts a certain amount of time, and then it goes to the next house. Okay. For example, in the upper room at the Last Supper, Jesus told the disciples, he says, go into town, and he says, when you, when you turn the corner or something like that, he said, you will, you will meet a man who is carrying a pitcher, of wa a pitcher of water. Now, when I, when my eyes were open, I'm talking about my, my spirit, my real eyes, your real eyes have to be opened so you can realize the real lies or the myths that you've been told were true and literal. And when your real eyes, your spiritual eyes, 
realize the truth, you'll know it, and the truth you know will set you free, and you will see, you'll see everything different. You will see, you'll see truth. It's like wearing x-ray glasses. I mean, you see everything. And you see it for what it is. Um, but Jesus said, go down into town. And he says, and you will meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. When I read that, after I, I could I could see it. And I'm thinking, how did I miss that? Because in Middle Eastern culture, no matter if it's Palestine, Israel, um, Nazarene, I'm not sure about Egypt, but I would suppose Egypt also, uh, Jordan, uh, a man would not be caught dead carrying a pitcher of water. That's something women do. Only women carry water. That would be like a man here um, running down the street in a pair of panties, you know. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So why would Jesus say that? Why would he say that to look for the man carrying the pitcher of water? Because he wasn't talking about a literal man. He was talking about the age of Aquarius. The water bearer. And he wasn't talking about them going down and into the city. He was talking about when you when you approach this age. When you approach this age, she says, not in Egypt, thank God. Yes, okay, great. He says, when you approach this age you'll see that it is Aquarius, the water bearer. Now, there's ministers, pastors uh, that will say, uh, don't, don't, don't talk about astrology. Don't get into that. Don't get into that zodiac. That, that's, that's of the devil. That's of, um, that's of Satan, you know. And, um, Really? Because uh, in the Bible it says in Genesis chapter 1, I believe chapter 1 verse 4, God, God himself says uh, that the stars are to be used as signs. And it's amazing how uh, these pastors and these uh, even evangelicals and these evangelists and these uh, doctors of theology teach that astrology is is satanic it's of satan and uh, it is demonic and if you well that's a good way to invite demons into your life don't believe them why is that because Jacob Jacob, who was later named Israel after he experienced enlightenment. Yes, he experienced enlightenment. And I'll explain that really quick, just a recap of that. That'll blow your mind in itself. Jacob named his 12 sons after the Maseroth, which is the Jewish zodiac. He named them after the stars, after the houses, the astrological houses. So any pastor, preacher, minister, teacher that tells you that astrology is of the devil, just look at them and say, well, then God must be the devil then because how do you explain what I just told you? You know, Jacob naming his sons, which became the 12 tribes of Israel, which became Israel itself, only it didn't. There again, it did and it did not. 
the true Israel has nothing to do with that strip of land in the Middle East. Matter of fact, if you want to know the dangers of taking this literally, you only have to look at the nation of the state of Israel today and the genocide of the Palestinian people. Yes. And I did I did four shows on how Israel is not is not um, God's chosen people and how that is not their homeland which they they began taking from the Palestinians or planning to take from the Palestinians uh, in the well since um, thousands of years ago but it really started in the 1800s and then 1917 the Balfour Declaration was signed and saying that the Palestinians would not have to move would that they could live with they could live in their home in, in their homeland and alongside the Jews, the Jewish people. 1948 comes and it is a it is a time to take advantage of the perfect situation and the land was bought by who? Uh, take a guess. Rothschild the Rothschilds. They bought and financed everything in what we now know as Israel. And if you don't believe me, um, look at the buildings. Look at every building in Israel and tell me what name is on it. It's either Rothschild or Rockefeller. Yes, absolutely. And but that's that's the error that's what happens when you take this literally they say well uh, this these uh, shows shows that I did I had um, I had people send me death threats I had Christians send me death threats Christian e evangelical Zionist uh, you know we will have Zion, you know, and uh, that God promised that to Abraham. And I said, <laughs> okay, I'm thinking, okay, this is really going to stir the pot and increase the flame. And I have to admit, I love it. I said, well, that would be all good and, and fine. If Abraham really existed, and they're like, "Oh my God, you did not, you did not just say that." And I said, "I'll say it again. That would be great if Abraham actually existed." I said, "But Abraham did not exist. He's a character. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob—all—they're all characters. Even Paul, even the Apostle Paul says." He says, don't, don't view them as actual individual people. He says, view them more as, as, as nations or, you know, he's saying it's metaphor. It's not real. It didn't really happen the way the Bible says it did. And anyway, on top of that, Abraham was not Jewish. Abraham was born in Ur of the Chaldees, which is about 58 miles south of Basra, Iraq. Yes, Abraham was Iraqi. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah, he was Iraqi. Um, oh, can I just you say, but... But you have the the um, uh, the uh, your custom 
where a man can carry water, but a man cannot be seen washing dishes. Well, um, whatever floats their boat. I mean, just because a man washes dish, uh, you know, dishes, if if that's a threat to your masculinity, you've got big problems. Uh, but anyway, thank you for sharing that. Um, but yes, Abraham was from what is now modern day Iraq. And God told him where to go and he went. Okay. Also, um, uh, there's people now that are calling, um, you know, President Trump King Cyrus because he's for Israel and, um, now Cyrus really existed. Okay. That's, there's, there's no doubt about that. Xerxes and Artaxerxes, they actually existed. Um, but get this, Cyrus in the time of the captivity of the Jews, which lasted 70 years, Cyrus um, sent Ezra, the prophet Ezra, back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple on the orders of the Persian prophet and um, the Persian prophet Zoroaster. Now, Zoroaster, um, his god was called the Lord God, which was the Lord God of King Cyrus, and his name was Ahura Mazda, just like the car, Ahura Mazda. King Artaxerxes was the king of Persia, which is modern day Iran, was called the King of Kings. Isn't that something? So, Ahira Mazda told his prophet Zoroaster to tell King Cyrus to let Ezra and the Jewish people go back and build their temple. Who did? Ahira Mazda. The god of Persia. Now I ask you this. Isn't it strange today that, or you know, when 911 happened, they said Afghanistan did it. So, the only logical thing would be is to invade Iraq. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. And they invaded Iraq, and it has been said, I'm not sure if it's true or not, but it's been said, and it was shown on, you know, television, and the first things that the that the first places the first things where the where the soldiers went and looted and destroyed was what the museums the history of Iraq why is that i believe that it's because abraham the father of judaism Christianity and Islam was from Iraq. And there was something there possibly that was that told the truth, this truth that I'm sharing with you, 
and they said, hey, do away with it. Now, now, way back, years ago, this, no, this same knowledge is why the Library of Alexandria was burned to the ground with all of that knowledge, all of those books in the huge library of Alexandria, burned to the ground. And that's why that, that the Crusades took place. It had nothing to do with protecting um, pilgrims and travelers to going to the Holy Land. It had everything to do with executing anyone and everyone who they thought, they even thought might know this truth and share it. Um, and if they suspected that you knew it at that time, you were dead. They would cut you down right there or burn you at the stake. This is the reason for people being burned at the stake in different countries, France, Italy, um, you know, and it's, it's the reason for the Inquisition. The Inquisition had nothing to do with suspected witches and witchcraft. It had everything to do with anyone who might know and hold this knowledge so the the witchcraft ruse, the witchcraft facade, you know, you talk about wag wag the dog. Hey, it's not a new thing. So they would bring people in and um, would, you know, they would bring a woman in that knew the truth, and they would um, they would do things like tie weights to her feet and drop her in a you know vat of water and if she sank she was a witch and she was burned you know she was burned burned at the stake or she was tortured or you know executed in a horrible way you know that's a no win situation and it's meant to be that way if you were caught with this in, in information or someone, you know, ratted on you and said, hey, they know the truth, uh, and, and you were caught, there was no way that, that you were going to have a fair trial and you were going to get away. You were dead. But what this is, is just this. In... Your brain, you have um, your pineal gland. It is a pea-sized organ. It's actually not a gland, it's an organ that sits between the two hemispheres of your brain. Okay? Now, if you get any medical dictionary and you look at it, you look at a 3D representation or cross section, look at that, and it's probably not going to show, some don't actually show the, the pineal gland itself. And the reason why is because actually the pineal gland is not really a part of the brain. It's in the brain, but it's not a part of the brain. It's very mysterious, really. It's, to me, it's like it's been placed there or planted there. But nevertheless, it's there and um, the, it's the highest point or the highest gland or organ in, in your brain. It sits sits higher up than the pituitary, which is the other gland that I want to talk about, because your 
pineal gland and your pituitary gland, they release, they secrete fluid secretions that enter into your spinal cord, your spinal column, your cerebral spinal fluid, and they flow down into the lowest part of your spine, which is your sacrum. And the word sacrum is Latin for sanctum or sacred place or could be tomb, as in burial tomb, okay? Now, the secretions that, the fluids that are secreted are um, oxytocin and vasopressin. One, the pineal gland releases a yellow golden fluid and the pituitary gland releases a white fluid. These two mix together in your spinal column flowing down to the sacrum and the ancients called those two fluids mixed the chrism C-H-R-I-S-M which means anointed which means Christ now you take the fact that the pineal gland is Joseph the carpenter Joseph uh, the father of Jesus or stepfather of Jesus according to the Bible, earthly father of Jesus according to the Bible. But I find it very telling, very uh, it's a red flag that just says, hey, this is not right, is that the Bible gives the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph. Wait a minute. Uh, why, why is that? Um, remember... Mary being a virgin, impregnated by God? Okay, uh, why, why the genealogy of Joseph um, when Joseph, when, when his blood or his DNA wasn't even supposed to be a part of Jesus? Makes you wonder, okay? The pineal gland is Joseph. The pituitary gland is Mary. Joseph releases uh, the pineal gland, which is Joseph, releases the yellow golden fluid. That is what the ancients called honey. The pituitary gland, which is Mary, releases a white fluid that the ancients called milk and there you have the land of milk and honey where does it flow it flows down the spinal column into the sacrum and the spinal column the spinal cord the cerebral spinal fluid if you take the human brain and you take the spine and the sacrum and you lay it on a map of Palestine, Israel. The, the brain is um, Jerusalem and the spine goes down the Jordan River into the sacrum, and the reason that I said sacrum means, um, you know, sacred place, sanctum, um, but I believe it means, also means tomb, or it can also mean tomb, is because if, if you do that 
to scale on a map, the sacrum, the human sacrum, lies exactly over the Dead Sea. So what happens? The fluid's released, it's called the chrism, and it goes down your spine, your spinal fluid, spinal cord, to where? To death. In the tomb. It's released one day, and how long does it last? How long do you have to raise that chrism back up to your brain for it to be, let's just say for now, taken care of? One day, no. Two days, no. Three days, yes. That's telling you right there. Jesus said, I will be in the earth three days. He says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. The chrism, the secretions where we get the word secrets, secretion is where we get the word secret, which is what? Hidden. Jesus, the chrism, goes down the sacrum where it is raised up the spine. How many vertebrae do you have? 33. How many years did Jesus live? 33 years. The chrism is raised up your spine through your seven chakras, which... You can't see them, but they're there. It's, it is energy. The solar plexus, the sacral chakra, the solar plexus ch chakra, uh, and you know, so on, up to the crown chakra. You have seven. Those are the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Those are the seven stars in the right hand of Jesus. Those are the seven candlesticks, seven, seven, seven. Those are the seven seals. When you raise this chrism, when you raise the chrism, the Christ, up your spine, guess what? Who opens the seven seals in the book of Revelation? Only the Lamb of God, which is Christ. And the chrism, the Christ, does exactly that. When, it's, when, when you raise it up your spine to the base of your skull for what? to be crucified to be refined remember Jesus said as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so I must be lifted up same way what the thing is is Moses God told Moses to make a brass serpent and to hang it on a pole and all of the Israelites that, you know, um, that God had um, sent fiery, venomous snakes to bite them and kill them uh, for complaining, believe it or not, uh, which is not true because it never happened. It's all metaphorical, telling our truth. So Moses made the brass serpent, put it on on a pole, and God said, "Every one that looks at that serpent will be healed, and they will not die." And that was, that was foretelling the crucifixion of Jesus, you know, thousands of years later, that what the Apostle Paul says. He says, for he became sin. What does the serpent represent? Well, it represents wisdom, but it also represents sin. 
throughout the ages, it's represented evil. People, you know, oh, serpent, you know, snake, it's evil. It's not evil. Matter of fact, Jesus told the disciples when he sent the 70 out, he said, be as wise as serpents, but uh, as innocent as doves. Be as shrewd as serpents, but as innocent as doves. So, the fact is, is Paul said that Jesus became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God that he was. So what Paul's saying is, is there was an exchange that took place there. The sins of the world, per se, were not laid upon Jesus, as is commonly taught, even if it is metaphor, even if it is an allegory, even if it is myth. The truth is, the sins of the world were not laid on him. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him and therefore be saved. Be saved, salvation, be enlightened, um, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the uh, baptism of fire. When John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, he said, he said, um, I baptize you with water. He said, but, uh, or, or he was, you know, baptizing people in the river. And he said, um, he said, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming who will baptize you with water and fire. What is that? What is water and fire? It's the opposite ends. It's the opposite end of the spectrum. Like heaven and hell. Like God and the devil. Good and evil. Hot water and cold water. It's the same element... The only thing is, is what's the key? The key is the temperature. Water is, is the same, cold or hot. You have good and evil, but good and evil, they're just words describing energy, neutral energy. That's not so neutral anymore. It's the intention behind using that energy that makes it, quote-unquote, good or evil. Now, this chrism, when it is raised, now keep in mind, Jesus became sin. He became the serpent for us. So what happens? That serpent has to be crucified. It has to be crucified where? At Golgotha. Where was Jesus crucified? At Golgotha. What does Golgotha mean? It's the Hebrew word for place of the skull. What skull? Your skull. My skull. Everyone's skull. It's not some some um, skull-looking little hill outside the eastern wall of the city of Jerusalem. It is the skull sitting on your shoulders attached to your neck. That's where Jesus was crucified and is crucified after being raised up the pole like Moses took the brass serpent and put it on the pole. Why a pole? Because it's talking about your spine. It's not talking about a literal pole. It's talking about your spine. Lift up the serpent and hang it on 
the pole. Matter of fact, in the New Testament, it says, everywhere it says Jesus was crucified on a cross, the actual word in Greek is staros, which means pole. Now, in the Old Testament, when Moses was before, you know, supposedly before Pharaoh, and um, he threw his rod down, he threw his staff down, and he became a serpent. What does that mean? It's symbolism of the serpent, the chrism that becomes the serpent symbolically that is raised up your spine to the base of your skull where you have 12 cranial nerves and by the way those 12 cranial nerves meet the 12 disciples yes meet the 12 disciples because that's what they are that's what they're based on the 12 disciples the 12 sons of Joseph 12 tribes of Israel Based on what? The stars. The stars. The constellations. The, astrolog the astrological houses. Now, you take that number 12. Say, well, you know, Jesus had 12 disciples. Well, that's true. But with Jesus, that makes 13, right? Makes 13. But Jesus was crucified. Jesus was taken away, so to speak. He was, um, he was buried, conquered death, raised from the grave, the tomb, and is, and, and is alive forevermore. Although we can't see him, he's hidden because he's spirit, correct? Okay. Have you ever heard of the 13th sign, the 13th hidden astrological house of Ophiuchus? Which means the serpent handler. The serpent handler. Which is, which if there's 12 astrological signs in the zodiac, and then there's the 13th, and there is, it spans over the largest black hole in our galaxy, possibly the universe itself, something like four, 400,000 light years across or more. It's massive. And there you have Ophiuchus, the sign of Ophiuchus. And it's a man, normal sized man, but the serpent that he is, is handling the serpent that he's controlling to scale is about I would say 70 80 feet maybe a hundred feet long and it is a monster and it's wrapped around it but he's controlling it he's controlling it okay now um, thank you Kim my cousin Kim she's uh She's, she's here listening, and I'm so glad she is. Um, but the, the black hole, the ancients knew about it. The ancients knew about it, and they wrote about it in your Bible. Um, have you ever heard of the bottomless pit? Hello, there it is. Jesus is the serpent handler. And people say, well, when I see a serpent, I kill it. Don't. Don't. Don't kill snakes. They have their part to do just like everybody else. Even if you saw one that big, don't kill it. Why? Because it's not literal. Do you know what the serpent is? What... What the serpent, the evil serpent in the book of Genesis that asked Eve, did he really say 
not to eat of that tree in the middle of the garden. Where was it? In the middle of the garden. Where's your pineal gland? In the middle of the brain, which is the Garden of Eden, which is, it's been said thousands of years, we have to return to Eden. What does that mean? It means you have to return to the kingdom of heaven, which is in your skull. You have a right temple and you have a left temple. Where is God's kingdom? It is in his temple, which is your skull, which is your brain. God told David, he told Solomon, you know, build me a temple, but I don't want to hear the sound of hammers and chisels. Whoa. That, uh, you know, Solomon's probably like, I'm good, but I'm not that good. I mean, what are you talking about? God says, there shall not be, and it's in the Bible, shall not be heard the sound of hammer and chisel. Well, tell me, how are you going to build an outhouse, for God's sake, without a hammer and without tools, much less a massive, um, huge, massive temple Solomon's temple was massive. I mean, we're talking huge stones, and uh, it, uh, yeah, people came from all over the world to to see Solomon's temple and and just you know revel in its uh, magnificence. But God said, "I don't dwell in temples made by human hands." He takes it further. You can't even use your hands. Why? Because his temple has already been built. What did Jesus say? The kingdom of God is within you. What is God's temple? You. You're God's temple. That's why God said, There shall not be heard the sound of hammer and chisel. Why? Because the temple is already built. The human body. What happens is that chrism is raised by meditation and it crosses the vagus nerve, which looks like, looks exactly like a tree or a small cross where it is crucified. When it crosses the vagus nerve, it is transformed. It, it's it is concentrated like 10,000 times. 10,000 times. It is concentrated just an unimaginable change takes place. When that happens, your pineal gland is activated And it is the only organ in your body, in the human body, that emits light. It emits a, a bluish, greenish, like a bioluminous light. But it only emits that light in total darkness. If there's any light source, a light bulb, a candle, light coming from under the door, any light at all, your pineal gland shuts down. It ceases to function. It quits. Remember the song, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine? We've been singing about the pineal gland since we were five years old. When did I find it out? At 51. Ow. Do I feel violated? I mean, come on. You know, it's, it's crazy. 
the truth is all around us. And just some, just some really quick, quick you know, things that that I want to share with you is um, Acts seven, chapter forty, uh, chapter seven, verse forty-eight. The Most High dwells not in temples made with human hands. First Corinthians three sixteen. You are the temple of God, for the temple, for the temple of God is holy which temple you are. So if so if God does not dwell in a temple made with hands, he could not be dwelling in the tabernacle or temple made with hands in the desert. And what's taking place right now? What's taking place right now in Israel? What is I'm sorry, but what is President Trump talking about? With uh, BB Netanyahu uh, building the third temple, I want to just you know walk over there and just you know just lean against the western wall and just put my hand to my chin and say, "You boys just don't get it, do you?" And attempt to explain to them the temple's already built. You're looking at it. You're looking at it in me, and when you look in the mirror, however gruesome that may be, you're looking at it. It's already been built. But, and they probably know that, being in the positions they are. But you know what? They're hell-bent on building it. Why is that? Control. Why? Because they have, the people, the masses have been misled to believe that the third temple must be built. And that is a lie. Matter of fact, it's not even the third temple because Solomon's temple never existed. Solomon's temple was never built. It is all myth. It is all a story to convey a higher truth. There, there has never been found any, any evidence of Solomon's temple or Solomon himself or David or Moses or the Exodus. None. None. But in the Garden of Eden, Eve, you know, it says the serpent tempted Eve. It was her own ego. And it wasn't even her. It's a story. Who is Eve? Me. You. Who is Moses? Me. You. Who are the children of Israel who complained in the desert and against God, which God is your brain, your higher self, your pineal gland activated? The children of Israel are your bodily desires. They said, we want to go back to Egypt, even if it means eating leeks and onions rather than being out here. It's all this spiritual stuff. We want to go back. What is that? That's your that's your carnal desires. That is your physical desires. That is that are opposed to everything spiritual. It wants fame, fortune, pleasure, and good times, and that's all it wants. Please self. Spirit is, is completely different, you know. Jesus, the Bible says that the devil took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, which was the highest point of the temple, and said, cast yourself down for he, God, has commanded his angels concerning you that you shall not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said, uh, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. 
that would be a really cool story if it ever happened. It didn't happen. Where was Jesus taken? To the pinnacle of the temple, the temple of your skull, of your brain. What is the pinnacle of the temple? What's the highest point in your brain? The organ? The pineal gland. Who took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple? Jesus did. I mean, after all, he was, he was man, right? So it was his lower mind, his ego, and the devil, his ego, the devil, the serpent, that must be crucified must be done away with and after that you're changed why do I say you're changed because after Jesus was crucified and and was raised from the dead just like you raised the chrism from the sacrum from the tomb from the Dead Sea back up into the to heaven which is your brain Jesus it says Jesus was walking on the on the Emmaus Road and with two of the disciples and they were talking to him and they didn't even know it was him. He was that physically changed. And they beat him. Isaiah says that beaten more than any man has ever been beaten. Of course, it's, you know, metaphorical, allegorical, whatever. But for that to happen, what is that saying? You don't heal from from those types of injuries, that type of beating in three days. What's it saying? It's saying that's how powerful the enlightenment process is. It changes you. You become a different person. You become empowered. It's truly empowered. That's why that... God, wrestling with Jacob, said, um, said, um, ask him his name. But first he said, um, he was, they wrestled all night. Did it night, darkness. They wrestled all night. And when, when God saw that he wasn't going to win he told Jacob he said let me go for the sun's coming up it's daybreak and Jacob said I won't let you go unless you bless me and God says what is your name well if he's God I mean come on he's, he's going to know Jacob's name and Jacob says my name's Jacob he says your name will no longer be Jacob but you will be Israel for you have striven with God and man and prevailed. And then Jacob says, what is your name? And quote unquote, God says, why do you ask me my name? And it says, and he blessed him there. Notice that. Did he answer his question? No. Skim right over it. Boom. Why? Because... Jacob asked him, what is your name? And if he had have answered, he would have said, my name is Jacob. You're talking to yourself. You see, there was no, there was no man, there was no angel, there was no God outside of Jacob that he was really wrestling with. It was not a physical wrestling match like UFC. Jacob was wrestling with his own internal battle between his lower mind and his higher mind. The Greeks called it the daemon, where we get the word demon from. But the daemon was what would be called, or what is really your guardian angel, which is nothing more than your higher self, your higher realization. And, and let me tell you, it, it is high. It is the most high. 
Who's the most high? God is. Who is I am? I am. You are. If you can just accept it. Um, anyway. So, everything, every, every single thing, every process happens. Every event is about you. It's taking place inside of you. Everything. There's nothing that is, that is taking place in the Bible that is not, that is not about you and taking place within you. And Jacob said, I will name this place Peniel or Peniel, P-I-N-I-E-L instead of P-I-N-E-A-L. Pineal and Peniel. And then it says, and he crossed by, um, by Phanuel, which is another pun on Peniel, and the Hebrew word Peniel means face of God. Whose face did Jacob see? He saw the face of God. What is God? God is light. What does your pineal gland do? It emits light. What did he see? He saw the light of his own pineal gland, his brain fully activated. The marriage of heaven and earth, which produces what? Heaven on earth. And I'm in an hour and a half now, so I'm going to um, call it a night. Uh, thank you, Nazreen. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, those of you that are listening and aren't taking part in the live chat. I wish I could 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 see who it, your names and uh, get to know you. But anyway, thank you for listening. And uh, thank all of you that are listening to this um, replay. Please, if you want to... Contact me. You can contact me by email at the Texas Podcast at gmail.com. Um, you can go to my YouTube channel. And, um, uh, you know, if you, you like, like these topics, uh, which this is going to be what I'm going to be teaching on uh, for a long time because I tell you, the rabbit hole is is like the black hole. It's, it's like the bottomless pit. It just keeps going and going and going. And um, just more and more and more truth all around us, everywhere, within us, without us, everywhere. So please go to, um, to www.spreaker.com um, forward slash or um, backslash um, show and then another slash the dash texercist and I will type that I don't know why I didn't do that to begin with but um, and if you would please please uh, you know, follow me there and Every time I go live, you'll be notified. Um, so um, that is www.spreaker.com for um, backslash show. Uh, wait just a second here. I'm typing this. I need a typist. Um, Okay. All right. 
There you go. And um, I would appreciate you following me. And if you like the show, please hit the like button. And um, hey, meet me back here tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Central Time. Um, and we will we will pick up where we left off with much much more um, that will be um, Monday let's see yes March 16th And at 9 p.m. Central. Anyway, um, if if you have any questions, if you have any comments, um, or you just want to say, hey, you know, this is this is really awesome. You know, uh, this is life changing because. Um, there's a certain freedom to be found when you know that 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 there's not there's not actually a God that is without you that's always looking at you um, writing down everything you do bad um, and you know keeping a record and just waiting to send you to hell it's the truth is for me the truth is much more comforting to know that God is within each one of us because we are gods and Jesus actually says that very thing he says um, he quotes Psalm 82 verse 6 he's talking to these he says says um, doesn't it say you all are God's sons of the most high and he shut their mouth with um, with those words and he was absolutely right because it is written Psalm 82, verse 6. You are all. You are all gods, all sons of the Most High. Anyway, love and light to you all. Love you all. Good night from Texas. See you next time.